Welcome to the third video in our Maintaining a Balance series. So this video is going to look at a number of uh, dot points all based around the idea of temperature. So the first one says identify the broad range of temperatures over which life is found compared with the narrow limits for individual species. Compare responses of named Australian ectothermic and endothermic organisms to changes in the ambient temperature and explain how these responses assist temperature regulation. Identify some responses of plants to temperature change. And finally, tying all that together by analysing information from secondary sources to describe adaptations and responses that have occurred in Australian organisms to assist temperature regulation. So we're going to start with the identified dot point. So identify the broad range of temperatures over which life is found compared with the narrow limits for individual species. As we know, living in Australia, we have quite a diverse range of temperature uh, environments throughout Australia. So these range from um, equatorial temperate areas, which are towards the north of Australia, through to temperate areas, which are around the uh, southern areas of Australia. And the difference in uh, the types of climates between those two are quite dramatic. So equatorial very hot and humid, whereas temperate, it's usually cooler in the winter, warmer in the summer, and they're usually the areas that probably have the most diverse range in temperature over monthly periods, whereas deserts, we can see massive variations in temperature over a 24-hour period. From this graph, we can see that most organisms fall within the temperature range of about 0 to 40 degrees Celsius. The optimal temperature for plants is about 25 to 30 degrees Celsius and most mammals will be found uh, to have a temperature range that is optimum for them between 35 and 40. And as we know for humans, the optimal internal temperature for humans is approximately 37.4 degrees Celsius. We can also see at the extremes of this graph uh, at a temperature of minus 40 degrees Celsius we have some musk oxen which are able to survive the Arctic snowstorms all the way through to our organisms that can handle extreme temperatures, so what are known as thermophiles, so, hydro, so hyperthermophilic bacteria, which are found near hydrothermal vents, um, which are caused by tectonic activity. So as we can see, uh, most organisms are found within this narrow range, zero to 40. However, we do have individuals that are found outside of that range. So what does this have to do with homeostasis? So endotherms are those organisms that maintain a constant internal environment and ectotherms are those that use the energy from the environment to regulate their body temperature. So one way to remember that is endo, uh, so endo inside, so internal stays the same, ecto outside so they get their energy from the environment. Most organisms live within the temperatures between 0 and 45 degrees Celsius. However, as we saw in the previous slide, living things have been found at the poles with temperatures below minus 70 degrees and around black smokers in oceanic trenches where the temperature is about 200 degrees Celsius. Most species have a very specific temperature range in which they can exist. For example, organisms that inhabit tropical rainforests and coral reefs have a very limited temperature range. Coral, for example, stag horn coral for massive reefs in warm tropical waters, no deeper than 60 metres, and reef fish, such as the white-tailed pygmy angelfish, are also only found within a narrow range of temperatures and will quickly die if the water temperature suddenly changes. And this is what we're seeing in the Great Barrier Reef. The temperatures are increasing because of climate change, global warming, and a lot of the coral is dying because they can only really handle living within a set temperature range. So the main reasons that organisms are found within a certain temperature range in particular environments is due to the specificity of their enzymes. And we spent quite a bit of time looking at this over the last couple of lessons, that if enzymes aren't within that narrow temperature range, then they no longer function properly. If the weather is too cold, the enzyme is stable but will not work, while in very hot temperatures, the enzyme becomes unstable and will denature. So we remember that denaturing of enzymes means that the active site changes shape, 
and no longer fits with the substrate that it matches to. So let's have a look now at some responses of named endothermic and ectothermic organisms to changes in the ambient temperature, identify some responses of plants, and then put all this together in our secondary source investigation. Now, just to clarify a few terms, the term ambient temperature simply re uh, refers to the temperature of the environment. And the term responses and adaptations can be used interchangeably. So don't get confused between the two. Um, they are basically the same thing. So let's have a look at some Australian endotherms and ectotherms. So as we said, endotherms are able to maintain a stable internal body temperature and they're not dependent on the environment to do this. So most mammals and birds are endotherms. These are also referred to as warm-blooded. You may have heard that term in uh, younger years in science. However, we try to get away from using that as it's technically not, they're not warm-blooded organisms, okay? So some examples, kangaroos, koalas, bilbies, wallabies, dolphins, uh, emus, kookaburras, okay? So Australian examples we need to know. Ectotherms, as we said, not able to maintain a stable internal body temperature and are dependent on the environment. So they need to rely on the sun or other uh, adaptations, behavioural, structural, etc., in order to keep their internal temperature stable. Fish, reptiles and amphibians are all mostly ectotherms. Again, sometimes referred to as cold-blooded, but we want to get away from using that terminology. So here we have a thorny lizard, a thorny devil and a brown snake, uh, a green and gold bell frog, uh, a Murray cod. So any type of Australian fish, reptile or amphibian will fit here under this heading of Australian ectotherms. So if you recall last year in year 11, we looked at adaptations in the local ecosystem topic and we divided them into three areas. So structural adaptations are physical features of the organism that allows it to be better suited to its environment. So remember that an adaptation is only referred to as an adaptation if it helps organisms survive. So basically structural adaptations are the way the organism is put together. So an example, an Australian example, remember we need to know Australian examples, is the bottlenose dolphin has a thick layer of blubber to insulate it from the cold and it also has a tapered shape and small limbs in order to reduce the surface area that is exposed to the cold water. Behavioural adaptations are ways that an organism behaves in order to help it survive in its environment. So one example of an ectotherm is a red-bellied black snake which will bask in the sun in order to warm its body when it's cold. So we see this a lot uh, during winter. Um, driving along the road, you'll see these lizards and things, snakes, laying on the side of the road trying to warm themselves up. Bilbies, uh, behaviour that they have is that they are nocturnal, so they will sleep during the day and come out during the night in order to avoid the hot sun, especially in the arid areas of Australia. And lastly, the physiological adaptations, these are the ones that are harder to see as they uh, relate to things that happen within the organism themselves. So a physiological adaptation is a feature that helps to regulate a function within the organism, usually to do with the functioning of biochemical reactions within tissues or cells. So the mountain pygmy possum, which is a, a little possumy uh, character, uses torpor, which is a process similar to hibernation where they're able to reduce their metabolism by up to 98% during the colder months of the year. And basically they um, do this and they go into an extended period of sleep and sort of ride out the winter. Also, another example is bats hibernate during the winter months. Again, reduce their metabolism so they don't require food and um, they're not expending energy. So, so we also need to look at some plant responses to temperature change. So there's a number of them here that we'll just quickly go through and then we can discuss them further in class. So leaf fall, so this is when the leaves drop off the tree. This reduces a surface area that is exposed to heat as well as um, area where water can be lost via transpiration. Dieback, in harsh conditions a plant may die but leave bulbs, roots or rhizoids in the soil. And when the conditions become favourable again, so when it rains, when the temperature drops a little bit, uh, the plant will be able to grow again. Uh, radiation, so shiny leaves reduce the amount of heat being absorbed 
by the plant as they're able to uh, bounce the light off rather than having it absorbed. And an example of this is the uh, pig face plant. The orientation of the leaves, so vertical orientation where the leaves hang downwards helps to reduce the surface area exposed to light rays and therefore reduces the amount of heat that the plant is exposed to. And a really good example of this is the eucalyptus tree. Uh, heat shock proteins, so molecules produced by plants under high heat stress, and um, these will help to stop the enzymes denaturing, which is our whole point of these responses to temperature change. Seed dispersal, some Australian natives rely on extremely high temperatures, for example, fire, to germinate their seeds. So an example is the Banksia, Banksia ericofolia. So we see this a lot during summer after bushfire season. So after a bushfire moves through an area, we see a period of rapid growth because that high temperature has allowed those seeds to germinate. And then once the rain comes through, which we usually have in summer as well, the afternoon thunderstorms, then uh, the water helps to get those seeds growing. Transpiration, so the movement of water to the leaves via the roots helps to cool the plant, just like sweating in animals. Vernalization is a uh, process where plants must be exposed to cold conditions for them to produce flowers and therefore reproduce, in particular bulb-type flowers such as tulips, daffodils. They won't actually grow unless you store them in a certain lower temperature range before planting them. And lastly, ice formation between the cells. So rather than the cytoplasm itself being damaged by ice being formed inside the cells, the plants are able to have the ice form in between the cell walls rather than inside the cell walls. So uh, that brings us to the end of the video. We'll be spending some time in class having a look at the secondary source investigation to now put all of this together and have a look and compare and contrast some of these different adaptations that plants and animals have, in particular, looking at the difference between adaptations of endotherms versus ectotherms, but as well as also tying together some of this information that we've been looking at about plant responses. And that brings us to the end of today's video. So thank you.